everyone, Costume Teacher here, and I'm here today to read to you Chapter 13 of The World According to Humphrey. Now, there are some vocabulary words I want to make sure that you hear and listen for before we begin. So, the first one is a phrase, and it is a mountain out of a mohill. Can everyone say mountain out of a mohill? <laughs> That means making too much out of a minor issue. <laughs> it says, no, I broke a nail. <laughs> I beg to differ, that is a big deal. <laughs> Teachers, we never have any students make a mountain out of a mohill, do we? Oh, no, absolutely not. <laughs> Moving on. Our next word is scowled. Can everyone say scowled? Scowled means to frown in an angry way, right? Hashtag mood. <laughs> scowled. Okay, and our final word is curious. Can everyone say curious? Curious means eager to know something. Like you're very curious about something. Hmm, maybe our friend Humphrey is going to be curious about something in this chapter. All right, if you are following along with the book, the chapter begins on page 102. <gasps> We're already over 100 pages into this book. How fantastic. And if you're just listening to this hamster, enjoy the chapter. All right. Chapter 13. Thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> Remember when we left off, Humphrey was going to go home with Mrs. Brisbane for Thanksgiving. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Since Mrs. Brisbane didn't say a word to me on the drive home, I had time to reflect on the last few months. I had not had a bad experience with any of the families I had visited. In fact, they had all been gracious and welcoming, except Miranda's dog, Clem, but I knew how to handle him. In return, I lent them a helping paw here and there. After all, you can learn a lot about yourself by getting to know another species. I was overdue for trouble, and I was likely to get it as at Brisbane's House of Horrors. That's how I pictured her home decorated with skeletons and bats and eerie jack-o'-lanterns all year long. I was shivering at the picture I had in my mind when Mrs. Brisbane actually spoke. Humphrey, I need you like I need a hole in the head, she complained. Same to you, I squeaked back rudely, knowing she wouldn't understand. I don't know what Bert's going to say about you, but whatever it is, it won't be pleasant. Nothing he says is lately, she continued. Bert? Who's Bert? Then I realized it must be her husband, the one who's sick. Well, I was certainly not looking forward to meeting him based on what I just heard. It won't be much of a Thanksgiving, she said. We don't have much to be thankful for this year. <sighs> but I'll try. Good for you, I squeaked. She almost smiled. Thanks for the support. The Brisbane's house was yellow with white shutters and lots of big trees. Colored leaves covered the front yard. 
<sighs> and on top of everything else, I have to rake, Mrs. Brisbane said through gritted teeth. Inside, the house was surprisingly cozy. Not a skeleton or bat in sight. Lots of pretty pictures on the walls and some big yellow flowers in a vase on the table. Bert, I'm home, Mrs. Brisbane called out. A few seconds later, an old man rolled into the room in a wheelchair. His gray hair was uncombed and stuck out in places it shouldn't. His chin was covered with gray stubble and he wore very wrinkled tan pajamas. His expression was so sour, he looked as if he'd just drunk a glass of vinegar. Mrs. Brisbane set my cage on the low coffee table. We have a guest for the weekend. I could tell she was trying hard to sound cheery. His name is Humphrey. Mr. Brisbane sneered. This is unacceptable. For the little pay you get, that school can't force you to spend your weekend babysitting a rat. <laughs> oh no. I bit my tongue to keep from saying something unsqueakably bad. They're not forcing me, argued Mrs. Brisbane. It's just that no one else could do it. Let's not make a mountain out of a mohill. Pardon me, but I resented being called a mohill almost as much as being called a rat. Mrs. Brisbane quickly changed the subject. I thought you were going to get dressed today. Why should I? I'm not going to see anybody, Bert Brisbane growled, except you and the rat. Mrs. Brisbane got up and walked out of the room without saying another word. Boy, nobody in room 26 could get away with talking to Mrs. Brisbane like that. I wish I could send her husband to Principal Morales' office right now. Everything was real quiet around the house for a while. Mrs. Brisbane changed her clothes to jeans and moved my cage onto a card table in the corner of the living room. Then she sat down and read the guide and care to feeding of hamsters and the chart my classmates kept on me. Looks like your friends have been taking good care of you, she said. Very, very, very good, <laughs> I squeaked. She fed me and gave me clean water and then she and Mr. Brisbane ate dinner in some other room while they watched TV. They went to bed early. I bet they didn't say two words to each other. Even Mrs. Mack talked more at home than they did. and She lived alone. The next morning, Mrs. Brisbane was up very early and soon the house smelled yum, yummy. I thought maybe I would like this Thanksgiving thing after all. At least the good smelling and eating part. Well, what I didn't like about Thanksgiving was Mr. Brisbane. While Mrs. Brisbane was clattering pots and clinking pans and making things smell good, he sat in his wheelchair in the living room and frowned. No, I don't... I know a better vocabulary word. He scowled. After a while, he called into the kitchen. Sue, why don't you stop all the cooking and just sit down for a minute? Mrs. Brisbane popped her head in the door and said it wouldn't be Thanksgiving without turkey and all the trimmings. Then Mr. Brisbane said he didn't have anything to be thankful for. Mrs. Brisbane went back into the kitchen and banged around some pots and pans again. That sour expression on the old man's face was starting to get to me. So I decided to take a little spin on my wheel. I really got that thing going at high speed. 
I was going so fast, I couldn't even see whether Mr. Brisbane was smiling or frowning. Finally, Mrs. Brisbane came into the room to sit down. Would you look at that, Sue? Her husband asked. He does that all the time, she said. Just spinning his wheels, like me. Stuck in a cage and going nowhere. Mr. Brisbane's voice was so grim, I stopped spinning. Whew, I was a little dizzy. You're wrong, Bert, said Mrs. Brisbane. Humphrey's not stuck. He goes everywhere. Every weekend, he goes to another house. He eats different foods. He gets out of the cage and runs through mazes. He runs and jumps and climbs. You're the one spinning your wheels and going nowhere. You're stuck in a cage, but it's a cage you made. Well, you could have knocked me over with a feather when I heard Mrs. Brisbane talk that way. Mr. Brisbane was surprised too. Do you think I wanted that car to hit me? Do you think that was my choice? He asked. Of course not, Bert. I'm so grateful you lived through it. That's the point. You're alive, but you sure don't act like it. With that, Mrs. Brisbane got up and went back to, into the kitchen. Meanwhile, Mr. Brisbane scowled and frowned and glared at me. Finally, Mrs. Brisbane put the food on the dining room table. I watched them eating their dinner from my vantage point on the table in the living room. They ate, but they didn't say much. The food's delicious, Mr. Brisbane finally said. That's the nicest thing I'd heard him say so far. Thank you, Mrs. Brisbane replied. There was silence for a while. Then Mr. Brisbane said, just think, last year after Thanksgiving dinner, Jason and I threw the football around the backyard. Now I'm stuck here and Jason is in Tokyo. Let's call him, Bert, his wife suggested. It's too early there, he said. We'll have to call later. Football. Jason. Tokyo. You can learn a lot if you stop spinning and start listening. I listened late that night when they called Jason, who turned out to be their grown-up son, who is working in Tokyo, which is far far, far away, even farther than Brazil, according to the maps in room 26. Boy, there were more Mrs. Brisbane's than I'd ever dreamed. One was mean to me. One was nice to students. One was a wife. Another was a mother. One was a cook and one wore dark pantsuits and the other wore jeans. But which one was the real Mrs. Brisbane? That night, as they headed out of the living room and toward the bedroom, I heard Mrs. Brisbane, the wife, say, I know you think I was being hard on you, Bert, but it really is time for you to think about what you're going to do with the rest of your life. Mr. Brisbane didn't answer. Tip 13. Remember, hamsters are very, very curious from Guide to the Care and Feeding of Hamsters by Dr. Harvey H. Hammer. Wow, well, we kind of learned a lot in this chapter if you were listening, am I right? 
We learned why Mrs. Brisbane maybe has been feeling the way she has this year. Her husband was in an accident and now he's in a wheelchair. That's a lot to deal with, isn't it? So again, the book is telling us to think about, you know people kind of on the surface, but there's this whole backstory that might explain why they're maybe acting sad or mad or stressed out or why they might need a little extra TLC, tender loving care. Am I right? <laughs> so I challenge you to kind of find the backstory about your classmates and maybe even your teacher. But also just think about, even if you don't know what it is, just in the back of your mind think, they might have a little more going on than I know. And so the best thing you can do is to show them some kindness and maybe bring a smile to their face while you are there, just like Humphrey does. All right, next time I will see you for chapter 14 <laughs> as we get closer to the end of this book. I hope you enjoyed this chapter and I'll see you again soon. Bye everyone.